Health, psychology, and human nature with Andre Stureson. Hey friends, hope you're having a great day. Are you following me on Instagram and Facebook? Please go to Health, Psychology and Human Nature on Instagram or Facebook or both for that matter to get the latest episodes, inspiration and more. Please take a pause and go there. Also, if you like the episode, please share it with a friend, family member or somebody else who you think might like it. Welcome back, friends, to Health, Psychology and Human Nature with me, André Stureson. A science-focused podcast where we explore, learn and improve our lives together. How does a week of exercise optimized for health and longevity look like? How does a one-minute workout at high intensity compare to a 50-minute workout at moderate intensity? What is interval training and why is it important? Answer to these and many other questions will be given today by the pedagogical expert Martin Jibala. Martin Jibala, he's a professor of kinesiology at McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada. His main interest is the phys- physiology of exercise, including the effects of training and nutrition and application to health and performance. Martin have also written the bestseller, The One Minute Workout, which you will learn a lot about in today's episode. Friends, I really hope you will enjoy this interesting episode. Martin, big, big welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. I, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure and an honor having you on. I know you've done some really fascinating stuff, so I'm really glad to be able to, to talk to you about all this stuff today. I appreciate the opportunity. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, but, but before, before we start, perhaps I, I want to just ask you about something else. Um, you know, when I was younger, I was traveling. I was in Asia and Australia, and I met a lot of Canadians. Um, and every Canadian that I've ever met has been really nice. And you also seem to be a kind person. I've just, we just been talking a couple of minutes now before we got started. Like, you know, are all Canadians that friendly or is it just me who have been lucky? It's certainly a bit of a stereotype. I would like to think that uh, Canadians, when they interact with uh, other cultures and peoples, that they're known as being quite friendly and uh, open. So I, I will take the compliment. I appreciate it and s- suggest that it's um, representative of certainly most Canadians, I believe. Yeah, great. If, if something goes really wrong, then I might come over to your country instead. <laughs> well, as, as I mentioned, uh, we lived in Scandinavia for a little bit, so I will reflect the compliment uh, back to you that uh, we certainly found uh, people to be uh, very, uh, very friendly. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, okay, so I know you're interested in a lot of different interesting stuff. You're interested in exercise, the health benefits of exercise, performance, the mechanisms of health when it comes to exercise. Um, what fascinates you about all these different things? So I, I think lot, I like a lot of individuals that get into the field of kinesiology. I was interested in sports as a, a, a young child and teenager. And in my second year of university, I took a course in human physiology that just fascinated me because I was learning about the heart and the lungs and skeletal muscle and how they produce, how those uh, systems produced energy, and I was able to relate that to my own interest in in performance. And so that was the initial interest in human physiology, and then it's really just developed from there because exercise, it's one of those challenges that stresses the entire body, and so the integrative response of the body just continues to fascinate me to this day. Uh, over time, while I still have an interest in performance, I've definitely become much more interested in the health benefits of, of exercise, which I believe is, is more of the primary interest to your audience. So I'm very much looking for the, uh, forward to the conversation. I would say my research now evolves on two platforms, uh, all focused on exercise, but one is very basic physiology. So literally, what are the molecular signals and gene pathways 
that turn on and are activated and adapt when the body undergoes the stress of exercise. So that's a very basic mechanistic aspect of my work. And the other aspect is the applied health-related uh, benefits of, of exercise, both in apparently healthy individuals as well as individuals who are at risk or afflicted with uh, diseases such as type 2 diabetes. Very interesting. So, so it's, it was kind of that you took a course and then you just got hooked and then you just continued your career from there, kind of. It is. And, you know, my interest specifically in interval training. So I've been at McMaster, my university, for about 20 years now. And so when I was first hired at McMaster, I was teaching a course, which I continue to teach to this day, called the Integrative Physiology of Human Performance. Again, many of the students who take that course are interested in, in athletics. And I would ask the students, why is it that these short, hard sprints can be beneficial for right. aerobic or endurance type performance? And that was at the same time where uh, my wife and I, she's a, a working teacher. We had two young children. And so my personal life was very busy. And so I was teaching <laughs> yeah. this work on interval training and tried it for myself and found it to be quite effective, at least uh, for, for myself. Right. So you just you, you kind of anecdotally felt that this was something that was suitable for you. And then that just created an, an even greater interest then for interval training. Absolutely. You know, one of the great things about being a university professor and scientist generally is that you're able to study what you're interested in and <laughs> yeah, you actually true. get paid to do that. Uh, and certainly when I first started on our studies, I didn't think that, you know, 20 years later, I would still be doing these studies on interval training, but clearly it has uh, taken off. Uh, the, the the field of research and it uh, it continues to be uh, we ask a lot of innovative questions I think even still today for sure I mean I've I've looked at some of the things that you don't have of course I haven't had time to look at everything but it's I think it's fascinating work and it's something that is really important especially I think also with the mechanisms that you're studying as well to be able to understand why things work because I mean the, the mechanism of exercise there's a lot of stuff going on so being able to figure out what what does what is seems to be very important. Absolutely, and I, I try to instill that in my students that uh, to indicate to them, if you understand the mechanisms, then you can, uh, you can be an informed consumer or you can evaluate whether this particular nutritional strategy is likely to work or not, or for those who are interested in performance, whether this training strategy is likely to work for you or not. But fundamentally, it comes down to having an appreciation for how the human body works and how it adapts to exercise. Exactly, very interesting. Um, I was thinking perhaps if we could go into interval training a bit. So perhaps if you could just like explain what interval training is in a nutshell. Sure, very simply, it's just alternating periods of more intense effort with periods of recovery. That's a very simple definition, but just this idea of hills and valleys, going hard, <laughs> yeah. backing off, and then repeating. Now, obviously, if you're an Olympic athlete, that's not a sufficient definition for you, and you want to know, well, how hard are the intervals? How long? How many? What type? How do I measure <laughs> intensity? But for uh, many people who are just generally interest, uh, interested in exercise for health, the message is alternating pattern of activity is likely to be beneficial for you. So there's even studies that have looked at interval training, just interval walking in individuals who have type 2 diabetes, and they've found that intermittent walking, even just gently picking up the pace, you know, you could imagine if your exercise is walking around the block, picking up the pace for a few light posts and then backing off, that's been shown to be better in people with type 2 diabetes at managing their blood sugar and boosting their fitness than just continuous steady state walking, even if the total dose of exercise uh, is the same. So there's a lot of nuance. I'm sure we'll get into that. But simply, it's going hard, backing off, repeating that. Very interesting. So, so, so in this study, the people who, were, who walked a little bit faster, and then they walked a little bit slower, and then a little bit faster, and then they just did that over and over, they actually had uh, more benefits than those that just kept on walking on, in the same pace. Exactly. And there's just more and more research like that starting to emerge. You know, I think some people, when they hear the term interval training, they think it only means this all out as hard as you can go crazy gut busting type exercise. Certainly that's one type of interval training and it's <laughs> yeah. a very extreme model. 
But at the other end of the spectrum is something as simple as interval walking. And yes, that's exactly what happened in those studies. These were overweight and obese individuals around 60 years of age who did, they were, you know, assigned to one of two different groups. And the total dose of exercise over several months was the same. It's just that one group did continuous, moderate interval walking, and the other group just slightly picked up the pace a little bit and backed off in three-minute intervals. And lo and behold, they found that, as I mentioned, their fitness was better. They even lost more weight and body fat, uh, and their blood sugar control was better in the interval group. And, you know, there's going back to the mechanisms, we can speculate a little bit about why that might be. But I think it's just a striking example of how just slightly varying the pace a little bit may offer uh, so, some benefits. Of course, it's the best exercise for you is whatever you like and enjoy and are, sure. are going to stick yeah. with it. But especially, you know, people are are time pressed or looking for how to optimize their exercise routines. I, I think there's a lot of support for an interval training strategy. For sure. And I think it's a very good point. I mean, I, I've listened to some of the stuff that you've done. And I think it's a very, very good point that it doesn't have to be, you know, the uh, I will just work until until I <laughs> until I I can't do anything more. It's also for people who are just starting off, perhaps who have been sedentary for a long time, and even at that level, be just walking faster, walking a bit slower. That is also something that seems to have have benefits. Absolutely, one of the biggest areas where interval training or this intermittent exercise has been applied is in the area of cardiac rehabilitation. So individuals who have had a heart attack. Uh, are put into an exercise program to try and help them to recover. And interval training has been uh, widely applied and adopted in uh, in 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 many areas. Uh, certainly, aspects of Scandinavia, Norway in particular, has been a very uh, leading uh, world center in in looking at this uh, this practice. And so, if you think about it, many people think you know. Well, if I'm going to have to exercise, I need to go for 30 minutes at a time continuously. And if you're just starting out, that's quite daunting for someone. And so with interval training, we're sort of, it's almost reversing the psychology or, or flipping it on its head and saying, you know what? It's okay to take a break. You know, so, <laughs> yeah, so exactly. Do what you can, take a break and pick up the pace again. And, and that's okay. Uh, you know, and then you're, you're doing exercise like Olympic athletes have done for more than a century. So it's how you frame the issue, I think. Yeah, for sure. Uh, what I what also would be very inter interesting to know is like, what is it that happens? Like, what is it that hap happens in the body when you do this interval training compared to doing, you know, a steady paced exercise like you're sitting on the bike and just going in the same speed for perhaps 50 minutes or 30 minutes like what, what are the differences in that, that that happens in the body when, with interval training compared to this other ev everyday exercise so so to speak so that's one of the million dollar questions and certainly something that keeps me interested as a as a scientist uh, i can provide some perspective perhaps so I, i'm a, a muscle physiologist so i'm primarily interested in skeletal muscle and how it uh, responds to the stress of exercise we know that when we do exercise, uh, the body literally remodels. So skeletal muscle changes its structure and it basically improves so that when we do the same um, insult, when we do the same bout of exercise, it's perceived as being less stressful. And that's the process of, of physical uh, training. How that process is initiated is you can think of uh, metabolic fuel gauges within the muscle. So there are literally proteins that sense changes in energy. And so some of these proteins, they respond to, they respond like a fuel gauge. So as the gas gauge starts to drop, the, the muscle responds and says, oh, I need to stimulate gene expression and turn on some of these molecular pathways. Well, you could imagine that with the traditional moderate intensity approach, the fuel gauges slowly drop over time and these molecules respond and are turned on. But with interval training, you have shorter, sharper or steeper drops in some of these molecular fuel gauges and it appears that the body senses those changes and so that may in part explain why interval training for a given period of time can lead to better adaptations because you have these multiple fuel gauge drops uh, often within a short period of time. And so what appears to happen is the general 
molecular remodeling process is the same, but we can trigger it or turn it on uh, through different stimuluses, through di different exercise strategies, uh, and we can turn it on in a more efficient manner, and by that I mean in a more time-efficient manner, uh, with an interval-based approach. So that's just related to, to muscles. There's some similar theories and evidence related to, for example, how the cardiovascular system uh, remodels when we do this type of approach. Very interesting. But, but are there any like benefits that are that you only get when you do interval training? Uh, yes. And so this is where it, it really, you know, I'm often asked the question, well, how does interval training compare to traditional endurance <laughs> exercise? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the unsatisfying answer is, well, it depends on how you make <laughs> the course. comparison. Yeah. So I, I, I think the, the one comparison is what I call the apples to apples comparison. And so that's where you compare the same total amount of exercise or the same dose one done in a continuous manner and one done in an intermittent manner. And there, I, I think there's fairly compelling evidence that interval training can elicit superior uh, responses, at least in some things, a major one being your fitness level. So your cardiorespiratory fitness, which is a major uh, risk factor for developing conditions like cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes and your overall mortality or risk of dying. So cardio fitness or cardio health, uh, I think there's quite compelling evidence that interval training, more intense exercise can lead to superior responses. Maybe just so we understand what, 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 what you just said there. So, so basically it's, it's like if you're doing a, let's say a 30 minute workout and if you're doing uh, these intervals instead of just keeping the, the same pace, then it seems like you're getting better VO2, VO2 max. So it seems like you're actually be, becoming yeah, more adapted than if you would only do the yeah the normal kind of exercise. Yes, I, I, I think there's, in my opinion, there's very strong data for that now. Uh, in science, you know, there's individual research studies, and then people might hear about these terms called systematic reviews or meta-analyses. These are where we combine the results of many different studies together, and pretty much every month there's a new systematic review or meta-analyses coming out uh, making that general conclusion that this apples to apples comparison interval training is better for enhancing your cardiorespiratory fitness. Uh, you mentioned VO2 max, which is the most objective measure of cardiorespiratory fitness. So, uh, in short, yes, intervals can be better at, at some measures when you make them on a, on a apples to apples comparison. Right. And, and then you have, uh, is there anything else than just apples to apples? <laughs> yeah. And I, so what I would call the apples to oranges comparison, and that's where you compare a fairly large dose or amount of the traditional exercise approach to a very small dose uh, of interval training, which involves much less time. Uh, there, I think the evidence would suggest that you can see comparable or similar benefits, despite the fact that intervals require much less total exercise and much smaller time commitment. Uh, and, you know, that resonates, I think, or is of interest to a lot of people because we know the number one cited barrier for why people are not more active uh, is time. Yeah, uh, sure. Clearly, it, it's an excuse for a lot of people, but many people live very busy, time-pressed lives and are looking for the most efficient approaches to exercise. Uh, and that's where I think some of the compelling evidence for interval training uh, arises because there's good evidence that uh, you can have at least similar benefits to the traditional approach, but you can get away with less time commitment. Okay, very true. So it's kind of, so it's, it's these different forms of, um, of exercise. Uh, so I would also very much like to, uh, to get into uh, like a kind of a, a perfect training week in a sense for somebody who is focusing on on health and lifespan. Um, so let's say that it's a person that is 35 years old who's already in pretty good shape. So a person that is exercising perhaps four times a week. And uh, this person also has unlimited amount of time. Uh, and the person can only do interval training. So focusing on health span, lifespan, uh, like a, tra a training regimen for one week, a 35 year old who's been pretty good shape and who has a lot of time. Um, like what would be, uh, 
would, would you say like what would be like an uh, an optical optimal week for for a person if you're focusing on health span and lifespan yeah and i guess i'll start by saying if if that's the person we're talking about they're probably already 95 percent of the way there because okay. clearly they're already <laughs> okay. they're already a, a committed exerciser uh they're engaging in in regular exercise so it's fantastic but specifically to answer your question um i would use different interval training strategies. So, uh, you know, there's a wide range of interval training patterns, um, all of which have been shown to be beneficial. And so when I get the question, what's the best interval training approach? I think for most people, we don't have the right answer. And so I look at it, it's a bit like investing. And so you can certainly pick one stock and maybe that stock performs extremely well and your portfolio does very well but it may be a dog, <laughs> you know, and it may not <laughs> yeah, do yeah. very well. So spreading out the risk, taking that analogy, I think you can apply it to an interval training strategy. And for a given individual, we don't know what, you know, there's, there's likely to be, you know, based on your individual genetic makeup and your responsiveness to training, there probably is an ideal strategy for you, but we haven't figured out a very good way to, to detect that yet. Right. Um, you know, and we know that if we give, a thousand people the same interval training exercise routine some are going to respond tremendously and some are not going to respond very much at all and so again to to mitigate that risk i think you're best to spread it around and so there there are some studies that have uh looked at uh what we call the the four by four so that's four repeats of four minutes duration with a little bit of recovery in between. So a typical workout might be 30 minutes, you know why, when you have a little warm up, a little cool down, and a few minutes of recovery in between. But those four minute efforts are performed at a fairly high workload. Uh, so if you can imagine a, a 10 point scale where zero is sitting on your couch, and 10 is running to save your child from an oncoming car or what I call sprint <laughs> yeah. from danger pace, <laughs> exactly. you know, maybe those four minute efforts are at about uh, a seven uh, on that 10 point uh, scale. So this is challenging exercise. You're huffing and puffing, but it's not all out sprints. And so definitely I would include uh, one of the workouts being a four by four. Uh, I would also include either uh, what we used to call the 10 by one. So 10 repeats of one minute effort. Now, these efforts are, are shorter duration, so the intensity goes up. And so you'd probably want to, those one-minute efforts to be an eight or a nine uh, on that 10-point uh, scale. So again, you're looking at about 30 minutes, warm-up, cool-down, uh, one-minute recovery in between these, these 10 intervals. Um, but there's more recent research that suggests actually a five-by-one may be just as good. So on those days when you're really time-pressed, Five one-minute efforts may give you almost all of the benefit of 10 uh, one-minute efforts. And, and that's reflecting some research that suggests there's diminishing returns over time. So if, if, if time is not an issue and you want the absolute best, then the more you do, generally speaking, the better. Uh, but if you only do 50% of the workout, uh, you're probably getting 70 or 80 uh, percent of of the benefit when it comes to uh, to general health. I think that that um, what you just said, Ado, I think that's very very important. So still, if you're so still like do we take the time to do that five times one example for example, then you're still getting a lot of the benefits. Exactly, and there's uh, again good, strong, compelling data for that. You know, perhaps I don't know, but maybe some of your listeners are interested in resistance exercise or weightlifting. And if you hang out in a gym, uh, you know, you'll always hear, "Well, how many sets of bench press should I do to, you know, maximize my strength?" Yeah. And well, the the reality is that the more sets you do, the the better. So maybe if you do three sets of bench press, your strength will go up by thirty five percent. Yeah. But if you only do one set of bench press, it's probably going to go up by 25 or 30%. <laughs> so again, you can get a lot of bang for your buck yeah. with that one set. And it, it, you know, it's a similar theme or variation when it comes to, uh, to cardio style interval training. So that, you know, five by one or 10 by one. And then I would suggest some, some very short, but very hard sprints. And, yeah. and this would be as hard as you can go. So you can imagine, uh, running uphill, uh, sprinting all out on a track, or if you're on a, on a cycle ergometer, setting the pace very, very high and pushing as hard as you can. 
for 15 or 20 seconds only and repeating that a couple of times. Now, you know, and those are close to that 10 out of 10 on the intensity scale. Uh, it's not necessarily for everyone. Not everyone can, can you know, is uh, that's not safe necessarily for, for everyone. But assuming you're otherwise uh, healthy, uh, those short, hard sprints uh, are very, very potent and very, very effective, uh, particularly on those da- days when you are uh, time pressed. Um, we've also done some research looking at stair climbing. Uh, you know, it's it's challenging to to climb stairs, even for individuals who are quite fit. And we've said, well, what if people just do about 20 seconds of stair climbing a few times a day? So it's a very practical strategy. On your way into the office in the morning, you take three or four flights of stairs. Uh, you do it again on your lunch hour, and you do it later in the day before you leave. Uh, even that has been shown to uh, boost uh, fitness. You know, it's not like you're doing the entire public health guidelines but as little as three 20-second stair climbing sprints through the day uh, can be effective to, to, bo- to give your fitness a boost. Very interesting. Okay, so, so, so you would recommend having the, doing these three exercises, a 4 by 4 a 10 by one or if you have li- less time, 5 by one and then doing this 3 by 20 seconds So it's those three different exercises that you would, would encourage to do. Yeah, and I say those because, you know, they, they sort of uh, run the spectrum, if you will, of interval training, uh, and, and all of those workouts have been shown, demonstrated scientifically, to enhance fitness, uh, as well as some other health parameters. And, you know, you would know from my, from my book, uh, the examples of workouts that I gave in the book, they all had to be grounded in science, and I could point to a published scientific study that had demonstrated that that specific workout had been shown to be beneficial uh, with a focus on cardiorespiratory fitness. Very interesting. Perhaps we could just go through those exercises just real quick, so so that the listeners, so that listeners know what to do. So the four by four. Could you just take that again, just a little bit sure. more in detail, just so that yeah. So uh, you know, warm up can vary. In most of our studies, we use relatively short warm ups of only about two or three minutes, and that's because we've been interested in the time efficiency. And so you can't spend 20 minutes uh, warming up. But, you know, if you have the time, certainly a more gradual or longer workout uh, is, you know, it's it's probably beneficial for you. So I would say warm up as you like. Um, If you don't have much time, then a short warm up of two or three minutes. Or if you'd prefer a more gradual warm up of 10 minutes or so, that's fine and that's up to you. So do the warm up as you like. And then the the four minute efforts. Again, if you are suitable to use a zero to 10 scale, uh, maybe a a seven out of 10 on a self-selected scale. If you're looking at heart rate, uh, you want your heart rate to be getting up around 80 or 85 percent of of its maximum. Those are sort of the intensity levels that uh, that we're looking at. Uh, As I say, you're it's challenging by the end of the four minutes. Uh, you're not necessarily completely winded, but it would be very difficult to carry on a conversation with someone other than uh, sputtering out a, a couple of words. So again, these are <laughs> yeah. these are challenging efforts. Yeah. Um, and then you would take a break for two minutes. So you would recover uh, for two minutes, uh, either stop completely or ideally just really bring the intensity of effort down. So if if those efforts were on a treadmill, you can imagine you're, you're sort of running at a vigorous pace uphill on a treadmill, then you'd slow the treadmill right down to a walk on the flat and you'd recover for two minutes. And then you would do another four minute interval and you'd basically repeat that interval recovery period, four minutes on, two minutes off, uh, three more times. Uh, And then you would finish with, uh, again, a short cool down, uh, depending uh, of, of the time that you have available and your individual preferences. Again, in our studies, we tend to use relatively short cool downs of only two or three minutes, uh, but you can certainly cool down longer uh, if you prefer. Uh, and in some of the studies that have applied this protocol in a cardiac rehab setting, uh, the the warm ups and the cool downs have been significantly longer than I just mentioned. All right, interesting. And, and about the, the ten by one, then, like, could you take the, some details on that as well? So very similar. Uh, uh, you know, basically, again, warm up as you like, and then it would be a one minute hard effort. So now, uh, you know, the, the pace you'd be running at was even faster, uh, because, uh, you know, you're only running for one minute. And so maybe that's, uh, 
an eight or approaching a nine out of 10 on that scale. So a very challenging one minute hard run or cycle uh, or swim or row, and then a full minute of recovery. And so what that, you know, there the, the work to rest ratio is, is one to one. Uh, previously, we were talking about two to one. And so what you see is the, the duration of recovery periods can be influenced by how hard and how long the preceding interval workout was. But to stick with what we're suggesting, one minute hard, one minute very easy, just again walking or cycling on an unloaded pace. And then you repeat that 10 times. So that's 20 minutes of a session. And then you cool down again for a couple of minutes or longer uh, if, if you like. All right, perfect. And then the last one then, the, the 20 second one. So our, this is where the, uh, the title from my book actually came from, the one minute workout, uh, because we've studied this protocol quite a bit and it involves three 20 second very hard efforts. And so our classic protocol is uh, a two to three minute warm up, 20 seconds of an all out sprint. So this is where 10 out of 10, you're running as hard as you can or you are cycling as hard as you can but only for 20 seconds. And then you take a full two minutes of recovery. So now very different. The, the work to rest ratio is, is one to six because you're going so hard during the work that you need a fairly long recovery period of two minutes. Then you do it again, all out for 20 seconds, recover for two minutes, and the third and final all out 20 second sprint. And then you recover for two minutes, which constitutes your cool down, uh, and essentially, you're done the workout. So start to finish, it's only 10 minutes in duration with only one minute of extremely vigorous exercise. But we've actually compared that protocol to people who are doing 50 minutes of continuous exercise. So, um, you know, five times greater exercise, uh, five times greater time commitment. And we sh showed very similar changes uh, in their skeletal muscle, in their fitness, and even markers of their blood sugar control after three months of training. And so it's studies like that that have uh, informed my opinion that these short, hard workouts can be just as good as the longer workouts, even though they require much less time. I think that is, I think that is really fascinating. So again, because I, I think a really, really interesting point here is that it seems like this one minute workout, so this three 20 second bouts of exercise is actually as effective as uh as three as a 50 minute moderate exercise there's definitely science to show that and now here's where i would you know here is all the usual caveats and, and you know when i speak to uh the news media uh they hate it when i do this because you know they don't <laughs> like the scientists to say well but this <laughs> but it depends <laughs> exactly but you know that's actually how science works exactly. and so it's great. the caveats to that would be most of the studies that we've conducted and others have conducted are what i call relatively small proof of concept studies. And so again, to use another analogy, if we think about the pharmaceutical industry, you know, there would often be well-established drugs on the market. And so you can think of the public health guidelines as a bit like the well-established drugs on the market. Uh, there's, you know, they've been tested, if you will, on many groups of individuals. Uh, we have outcomes, including death rates, so we know if people do this amount of exercise, they will tend to die less or they will develop cardiovascular disease uh, less. Uh, then when a new drug emerges on the market, they will start with these initial small scale human trials, you know, not unlike what's going on in the world right now with COVID-19, where new vaccines are starting to be tested. There's some very small preliminary studies. And then eventually they need to ramp those up into very large scale randomized trials where the the standard of choice is compared against the new emerging drug it's a bit like that with interval training uh, so interval training is showing a lot of promise in these early phase trials we're starting to move almost into these phase two trials but we really need these long-term large-scale studies uh, in different groups of individuals different sexes different ethnicities and looking at many different outcome uh, variables. So, so like I say, that that's a caution. And when I get the question, well, why is interval training not in the public health guidelines yet? 
it's because generally speaking, the people that write the public health guidelines want to see this much more robust uh, grade A um, evidence. Yeah, for sure. But I mean, it's, it's, it's really, really interesting, the, the results that, that you had so far that such a short period of exercise actually seem to be able to bring about the, the same benefits as these, you know, 50 minutes. But one, one thing that I'm wondering about is like um, at what, what intensity or what level did the, um, did the control group, the, the 50 minute moderate exercise group, how, how, like at what level did they exercise? Yeah. And so what we try to do in the comparison group was model public health guidelines, which are generally 150 minutes a week of continuous moderate intensity exercise. So that's at a heart rate of about 65 to 70 percent of maximum. And there's various ways that, that are, you know, standard to characterize moderate intensity exercise. And so that's where we came up with the 50 minutes because people did that three times a week. Yeah. So that group was doing 150 minutes a week of continuous moderate. The other group was doing three 10 minute bouts, as I mentioned, uh, or three 10 minute sessions. And within each of those sessions, it was only one minute of very vigorous exercise. Yeah. Um, I, I just feel, I just think it's amazing. I, actually, I, I tried this yesterday and I did a version of it just before we started this conversation today. Um, and yesterday I did five bouts, about 30 seconds of burpees, and I just gave it all I had. Um, and it's just, I mean, the feeling of doing that compared to sitting on a bike for 50 minutes is just, I mean, of course it's, it's daunting and of course it's, you get tired, but it's, it just feels so much easier than sitting on a bike for 50 minutes. And, you know, the, the, the people who study exercise behavior, right? And so what's going to motivate people to stick with exercise? You know, how much do people like and enjoy exercise? Interval training is, it's not for everyone. And, you know, I'll often say there, there's no free lunch when it comes to exercise. Yeah, and sure. it's nice to talk about these short sessions. But as you just referenced and experienced, this is demanding, very challenging exercise. It's very uncomfortable exercise, or it can be for these short periods uh, of, of time, but it appears that at least some people are, are willing to make that trade off and they will say, look, uh, I'm willing to go hard for a very short period of time because I can get away with a lot less exercise and you know, maybe you don't feel like doing that every day and that's fine and, and that's why we wouldn't suggest people do the exact same workout all the time. Um, some people like to do that. You know, they like a very structured routine and they wanna do the same thing all the time that's fine, uh, but the exercise behavior people would tell us that varying it up and changing up the approach is likely to be more beneficial for most people over the long term. And I think that's one of the other nice things about interval training. It offers infinite variety. You yeah. know, there's only so yeah. many ways to, to jump on a treadmill and jog at a moderate pace for 45 minutes. But with interval training, you know, we just talked about three examples. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's so many different examples. And, and so people can really vary it up and, and change it up all the time. And I think that is part of the appeal. For sure. I, I was also wondering, um, now when I did, the, I did the burpees yesterday and I did 30 seconds. And like after 30 seconds, I was really feeling like I hit a wall. It was kind of like, you know. I got, I, I got, uh, I had a hard time breathing and, you know, and I really felt my heart pumping. It wasn't like it was uncomfortable in a, in a weird way, but I mean, it was, I was, I was exercising quite hard. Um, would that be like similar to the, the wind, I'm not sure what it's called, the wind test or something like that. Would, would that be similar to, similar to that or did, do they do it even harder? Yeah. So a couple of th So the, the, it's, it, what's it's called. So many of our studies, we use what's called a Wingate test. And you know, that, that uses some specialized, uh, it uses a specialized bike that's very challenging for people to mimic on their own. But what for your listeners, what they could think of is imagine going to the gym and getting on a life cycle or one of the standard exercise bikes that's at the gym and turning the setting all the way up to 20 out of 20. Oh, so yeah, okay. it's, it's extremely difficult. And, you know, even if you were to pedal for 20 seconds, after about 10 seconds, your legs are already starting to burn and it literally gets harder to turn the pedals. Right. You know, that is a bit like a Wingate test, uh, which is 30 seconds uh, in, in duration. And so to go to your point about burpees, it's a little bit different 
of a challenge. So body weight interval training, it's a form of resistance training, like lifting weights. And so the that stress on the body is a little bit different than when we do cardio style uh, interval training. You can almost think of it being on a on a continuum. Um, and so with with body weight style interval training, I'll often say it's a bit like a, a hybrid style of working out. It will definitely provide some of the cardiovascular benefits, and we know that you could do an all burpee workout uh, and improve your your cardiovascular fitness. You probably wouldn't improve your fitness to the same extent as if you did traditional cardio style interval training on a bike or a rowing ergometer uh, or running outside. But the benefit of the burpees and the body weight style training, it gives you some strength benefits as well, which you don't necessarily see with cardio style training. And again, this is part of the fascination as a scientist in me. And we'll look at, okay, well, are, is this workout turning on the signals and molecular pathways that we know is associated with muscle growth and hypertrophy? Or is, is it just turning on these pathways related to mitochondria, which we know uh, produce or enhance aerobic energy uh, provision. So the, the specific mode of exercise can have some effects there, and body weight style interval training is going to be a little bit different than traditional cardio style interval training. Right. Like how many seconds do you think of, like if you, if you do all in burpees, for example, or, or some other body movement, like how much time would you say resembles a 20, 20 second windmill test or wind gate test? Yeah. Pr you know, probably there, the, the, the time is, is pretty close. And so in terms of that central cardiovascular challenge or that big increase in heart rate and getting out of breath that you experienced, I think, you know, if you're doing burpees very intensely, uh, that feeling is not that dissimilar to the feeling <laughs> that you would get at the end of, uh, of a Wingate test. Obviously, the Wingate test, it's all of your legs, whereas burpees, <laughs> it's a more generalized, uh, you know, whole body yeah, yeah. Uh, fatigue. Yeah, it's funny because it just remember how it was yesterday you know it's, it's always these 30 seconds and then I'm just lying on my on my back and then just you know just uh, get my breath back but it, it, but a thought that I had after and which I reflected on this morning was that I mean even though it was 30 seconds of hard exercise it's only about 10 of them that it's really hard and about 15 that is actually I mean feels like I'm exercising the first 15 of seconds of the burpees it just feels like doesn't really feel that that hard because the body hasn't been able to react yet. So it, exactly, and even if you if you look at some of the more classic research on cardiac rehabilitation, you know, now they weren't doing burpee style; they were doing uh, treadmill or cycle exercise. But that was one of the observations: is that even in these very deconditioned people, they could perform at relatively high workloads for short periods of time, and they actually found that the cardiovascular stress was not as great as you might otherwise think. And so that was some of the initial cardiac rehab studies that, uh, that have obviously been developed uh, since then. Yeah. I mean, when, when you did the first study and you got the results, like how happy were you <laughs> with the results that you got? Yeah. So, you know, being the cautious scientist, when I would first start to see the results from my trainees uh, and I would say, okay, r run the analyses again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then do it again. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And I, <laughs> You know, uh, when we first started to present some of this research, I, I distinctly remember, and I write about it in my book, uh, it was at one of the local scientific conferences in the region where I live, and a person stood up and said, you mean we could just do these very short, you know, exercise bouts and expect to increase our VO2 max? You know, that, that can't be. And there was a lot of skepticism, and yeah. so definitely I was relieved and excited when other groups started to replicate our findings. And the other point I would make is, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, the longer I've been an interval training researcher, the more I've come to appreciate both the scientific and athletic history of interval training. Because in some ways, we're just rediscovering interval training. You know, yeah, we're, we're yeah. reinventing the wheel to some extent, and people will call me the guru of interval training, but it's like, actually, People knew this, you know, <laughs> six years ago. Yeah, and uh, exactly. there were, you know, there were Scandinavian athletes winning gold medals at the turn of the century by performing interval training. So yeah. we're, we're not as smart as we think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. But I, I, I mean... I understand the the people who stood up when I listened to you because it feels like intuitively when 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 I when I read about it the first time I saw it the first time, it just felt too good to be true. 
and and it's not so it's great <laughs> no a- a- absolutely but also you know you make a good point and it's until you actually do like it's fine to say okay three 20 second efforts but when we talk about three 20 second all out efforts and you experience that the degree of effort that's actually required and the degree of fatigue that that can cause and for a lot of people who only do moderate intensity exercise they never reach to that level. You know, yeah. unless you've been a high level athlete, you've probably never challenged yourself like that. And so for a lot of people, it's like, wow, that's that's a very new feeling. And now maybe I understand why it is uh, it's potentially so effective. <laughs> you just had you had to take care of everybody who was in the studies afterwards. Like <laughs> yeah, give it, give it, them it, give them a blanket and a cup of tea or something. <laughs> it, it, exactly. And you know, again, not to overstate it too much, but you know, these these all out workouts are definitely not for everyone. Uh, yeah. And for some people, it can leave them feeling, you know, quite, uh, quite uncomfortable for a period of time. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, great. I was thinking also, because I know you're also really into um, like health and lifespan and everything like that. Also, when it comes to, um, to exercise. And I think we should just not leave uh, intensity uh, or interval training completely. But I was also wondering if we could talk about the same thing, but that you could choose from everything so let's say that, that you would you would you would make an optimal week for and you optimize for health span and lifespan again and a week that you can do long term it's the same person a 35 year old who's already in pretty good shape um and you again you have unlimited amount of time and you can choose you can choose from everything you know that's available so, you know resistance training moderate intensity continuous training interval training yoga all the things that everybody can access um, what would a, a like a, a perfect week look like uh, for a, a person who would optimize for health span and lifespan? Yeah, so I, I think building on my theme of variety, you know, I, I recommended variety when it comes to intervals. I think when it comes to your general exercise and physical activity program, uh, variety is good as well. And so yeah. you definitely need to be building in those strength training elements. Now, whether that means uh, this is where I think personal choice comes in. Yeah. Some people really like to go to the gym. They like to lift weights. Uh, they enjoy the social atmosphere of being in a class uh, together. And if you like that approach, then definitely do that. Um, but whatever you do, definitely get in strength training and s- twice a week at least. And and so that could be body weight style strength training that you do on your own. So myself, for example, in this pandemic, my own workout routine has not suffered or been impacted that much. And that's because I'm fortunate basically to have a a, a home gym. You know, I have a power rack, I have a cycle uh, ergometer, I have some weights, I have some kettlebells. And so I'm able, and and I don't mind, I'm very committed exerciser. I can work out on my own very easily, either put a podcast on or watch sports typically, or used to watch sports on on television. (laughs) Um, you know, I, I don't find myself needing to go to the gym, but for others, they, they do. My wife is very different. She very much likes to go to fitness classes. She wants to basically shut her brain off and have someone else lead and tell her what to do. And that's what she finds to be very effective. So this is where I think knowing yourself and what appeals to you is important, but definitely twice a week, you should be doing uh, whole body strength training, whether it, that's would weights you, would or you, whether would, that's body would you, weight. Would you say that so? Uh, so for an optimal, but would it be two times a week, or three, or four, or like if you would just if I had to push you a little bit? <laughs> yeah. So h- how's this? The public health guidelines generally recommend strength training at least twice a week, and so yeah. I think that should be the the minimum. You know, if if you have a week and you're a committed exerciser, and I would put myself in this group, generally. I'm six days a week. I, ch- I try to take one day off. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm still active that day. I'm at least going to take the dog for a walk, but we also know that building some breaks in. So, you know, if you're going to push me, I, I, I would say if you're going to exercise six days a week, then what you could have there are definitely three cardio days. I would say at least two of those days should be interval based, but the third cardio day, again, either if you like some sort of continuous exercise, go for a long walk in the woods or go for a prolonged uh, jog on the trails just to build in that variety. But if you right. don't like that and you don't necessarily need that variety, then I think a fully interval-based approach to cardio yeah. can work extremely well. I also think a fully interval-based approach to strength training, which I would recommend on at least two of those other days and maybe three days, um, you could do body weight style intervals or workout or replace one of those third strength training days 
with some sort of flexibility training, uh, yoga, Pilates, uh, you know, and we know that flexibility and balance training, especially as we age, uh, becomes increasingly uh, important. So how about I'll say three cardio days, either all three of them intervals or two intervals and one moderate, uh, and two strength days and one uh, flexibility, uh, yoga, stretching type day. Perfect. Sorry for pushing you a little bit. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's, uh, it, I, I, it's good to be pushed. Because, yeah. you know, it, it's easy to sit up here on the pedestal as a scientist and you know your your work doesn't translate to real life at, at all. And so it's it's important to uh, to have to put it in perspective. Yeah, great. Okay, so so three, so two so two interval days, um, and if you want three. And and would you say also that you would also then choose the three different, uh, the three different exercises that you that you mentioned before, perhaps? Uh, yes, and so I so I definitely incorporate the variety. It's not essential that you do the variety every week, though. And so for some people, they like to use a typical interval training uh, session for two weeks or a month, and then they switch. So I do think variety is important. But it's not necessarily that you're doing something different every day. And again, this is where it's whatever appeals to you the most. So build in variety. But whether you change it up every couple of weeks or you change it up every workout, that's up to you. Perfect. And also, when, when you talked about the resistance training, you mentioned, uh, what, what did you say about that? Did you mention that it was an uh, interval based or what would you say there? Yeah. So in certainly when it comes to body weight style uh, training, it's almost always interval based, right? And so you could imagine doing a series of push ups and then taking a break and then doing a series of lunges or air squats, then taking a short break, then maybe some, some pull ups, uh, uh, you know, then maybe some mountain climbers or if you like kettlebells. So a body weight style approach to uh, training is, is often an interval based where you're going relatively hard, you're taking a break, and then you're doing another type of, of, of body weight workout. So I think body weight style training is highly suited for an interval based approach when it comes to more traditional resistance exercise, you know, weightlifting at a gym, you know, in some ways it is a, a version of interval training and that, you know, maybe you're lifting for 15 or 20 seconds and then you wait for two minutes and then you do another set of bench press. Uh, so, it, you know, th that's a bit of a stretch, I think to call that interval training. But again, the point being, definitely do resistance exercise. The type uh, is up to you and you can definitely have effective strength training and muscle building by using completely body weight style approach or near complete body weight style approach or a more traditional style approach with heavy weights uh, or machines. And, and did, I, did I understand you right that you didn't think that it actually mattered if you did this uh, interval interval style of, of resistance training or if you did the kind of old school go to the gym lift weights? Uh, correct. I think they're probably, you know, it depends on your goals a little bit, right? If, if yeah. you want to be a power lifter, then you better be lifting heavy weights <laughs> yeah. uh, and, uh, and things like that. But, you know, again, uh, people should not model their training after me, but I can only speak for myself. Certainly over time, you know, when I was younger, I liked to lift heavy weights and try and do lots of squats and bench press. And then as I've gotten older, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm going to be 52 soon. Um, you know, I've, I've moved much more towards body weight style interval training. And most of my workouts now are, are push up based. Uh, you know, I'll use it, It's tough to train your back, uh, without, uh, using some sort of equipment, but yeah. I have a power rack in my house. And so all of my, my back training is, uh, is, is traditional chin ups and pull ups and things like this. So, you know, there's, we, I think we call this now functional movement style training, but, or, or it's, you know, gymnastic style training, but I think it's highly effective and it, it certainly works for me. And the benefit of it is, uh, you know, you, you need very little specialized equipment. Uh, I, I used to call them hotel room workouts when I travel, <laughs> yeah. you, know, you only need one square meter and you can have a very effective, uh, workout. And I think that really resonates right now with so many people stuck at home because of COVID-19. For sure. Uh, I was also thinking perhaps if you could give an example of a workout of, a, you know, a, an old school, go to the gym, lift weights. And also this, um, yeah, the resistance training that you're talking, alluding to, which where you're doing a more interval based. Sure. So, you know, if, if it's a more traditional lifting weights, you know, I, I, I think obviously you want to be alternating push and pull style exercises. So classic push exercise would be something like uh, the bench press. 
which again, you can either do with free weights and a, a, a barbell, um, or you can use a, a, a machine. Uh, you know, I, I think many people would recommend uh, free weights over machines uh, because free weights, you know, you're you're utilizing more muscles. You have more muscles that have to balance the weight, uh, unlike a machine where the the pattern is basically guided for you. But again, compared to nothing, either of those are are are, are good. So. Pushing exercises, ideally those that are multi-joint in nature, you know, so if you're doing a push-up or, a, sorry, if you're doing a bench press, um, that's uh, primarily challenging the chest and the triceps, but you have some shoulder muscles. Uh, you know, another uh, classic movement, of course, is is the barbell squat, uh, where, uh, you know, you you obviously uh, squat down with a barbell on your uh, on your shoulders. That's, you know, getting the, 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 the glutes, the quads, your legs. Uh, you can also do those with with guided uh, machines, and you want pull exercises. You know, I mentioned uh, pull ups, but there's obviously a lot of uh, different weight machines that you can utilize uh, to to train things uh, like your uh, your back. So again, generally speaking, you want to incorporate push and pull movements. Uh, these classic multi joint, multi muscle movements are, are 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 best, I think. So things like bench press. Um, uh, squats, uh, as I mentioned, some sort of rowing or, or pulling, uh, motion, yeah. you know, and then some of the exercises are more what, uh, you know, I think a lot of people call the beach exercises, you know, the, the bicep curls <laughs> yeah, and yeah, things yeah. like that, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're probably lower down in terms of the, uh, the level of importance. Yeah, for sure. And, um, and about like the, about the time, like how, or how many, how many sets or how long time do you think a, a good workout should be for your health and longevity when it comes to resistance training? Yeah, you know, so we're going back to our initial point there for about sure, yeah, uh, one yeah. versus two sets of bench press. But again, you know, I, personally, I rarely work out for more than 20 or 30 minutes. You know, mm. I'm pretty much doing something every day, but you can use your time extremely efficiently. Now, uh, that's not for everyone, right? But I, 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 you, don't, you don't need more than 20 or 30 minutes uh, of body weight style training or working out in the gym uh, with free weights, um, you can be extremely uh, efficient there. And I think, uh, you know, moving from one exercise to the next, almost like a circuit style pattern uh, is likely to be effective. And that can save time on the recovery because if you're moving from a bench press to a squat exercise to a pull exercise, your chest is recovering while you're doing those other exercises. Now, that's not necessarily feasible in a gym, and many people in the gym don't like those people who you know, <laughs> monopolize all of the equipment at one time. It's like, hey, lots of other people are working out here at the same time. Yeah, so, exactly. <laughs> when you have your own equipment, it makes it a little bit uh, easier uh, for that. And again, you know, not to many people exercise and appreciate the social aspect, and for so sure, spending sure, an yeah. hour in the gym and interacting with others is what you like and enjoy. And your workout takes an hour. Who cares? You know, the main thing is that you're getting it in. For sure, for sure. And and when you're talking about these twenty or thirty minutes, then it's kind of continuously just going from exercise to exercise, and just not having these two minutes breaks. It's more, you know, having these twenty seconds breaks, perhaps, than just changing from bench press to squats, for example. Yeah, I think keeping the the recovery period shorter, you know. And again, I'm sure we won't get into it, but there's a whole another debate to be had. Was are are longer or shorter recovery periods better, right? Uh, yeah, and it, yeah. there's a lot of caveats there. But yeah, I don't think you need more than 20 or 30 minutes, but you need to be efficient then in terms of how you're structuring your uh, your your workout and uh, and utilizing your time there. Okay, perfect. Um, I, it also would be very interesting to go into one of the interval, um, one of the one of the types of interval training. Perhaps we could do perhaps we could do the the four by four um just a little bit more in in detail to talk a little bit more about how it, what, why you, why why we have the things we have so for example so we start off with a warm up right why, why do we have the the warm up before when you do the 4x4 four four? yeah so for generally speaking what warm up serves to do is it it literally warms up the muscles so you're elevating the temperature uh in the muscle and what so what that's doing is a couple of things one uh, we know that some of these metabolic processes, these enzymes, so you know, inside your muscle, there's these components called enzymes, which are responsible for for breaking down fuels. And the enzymes generally work better at higher temperatures. So part of it is uh, that's that would be the aspect of 
metabolic warm up where you're literally heating up the muscles because some of the components in the muscles work better uh, when they are hotter, um, right. obviously within a narrow range there. Also, warm up serves to uh, open up the cardiovascular system. So you could think of unraveling a garden hose. Uh, and so it makes it easier for the water to flow through uh, the garden hose. So literally, you open up your blood vessels and it makes it easier for the blood to move through. And what that blood of, is doing, of course, is bringing oxygen and fuels to your muscles so that they can produce uh, the energy. So it work, mo- warm up works across multiple systems in your body to help literally prepare it for the challenge of, of exercise. Right. And then, and then you do the, the four minutes, like, like in this exercise, for example, why do we do the four, well, why do we have the four minutes? Um, yeah, the, why do we do, why, why do, why are we exercising for four minutes? Right. And you know, why, why not three minutes? Why not five minutes? And you know, the <laughs> yeah. reality in some of these is because someone originally started, they obviously had some sort of idea or hypothesis for why they would pick a certain time limit. And they probably found that it worked and then things <laughs> yeah. to catch on from there. But You know, again, it was some of this research in Norway where their classic protocol was four by four minutes. And actually some of that started uh, in the training of of football players, of soccer players. Uh, And then they started to apply that in in their cardiac uh, uh, studies. But the bottom line is they found that it works. Uh, And we also know, again, generally speaking, that from athletics, individuals who train using repeated three to five minute efforts hard efforts, that sort of seems to be the sweet spot for maximally increasing cardiorespiratory fitness or VO2 max. So the athletes that want to most develop their VO2 max capability, they will tend to train by using repeated efforts that last three to five minutes in duration. That's not to say other type of training is not effective for VO2 max, but when we look at all of the science, that's sort of the sweet spot for that range. And so I'm sure that in part informed the decision to go with four minute duration uh, workouts. Right. And, and then you're, you're supposed to go, I think you said eight or almost nine. Like, wh- why is that the sweet spot there? Yeah. And so again, based on the science, you know, if, if you're to do exercise that lasts four minutes, that's relatively intense, um, you know, you can't go all out because literally you would have to stop. You would get <laughs> yeah. tired and stop. Yeah. Uh, and, and so from the scientific studies, that, again, tends to elicit heart rates of around 85% of maximum. So, again, obviously when you're starting out, your heart rate's relatively low, but it's building over time. And so by the end of the interval, it's at about 90% of maximum, and then you give yourself the break, heart rate starts to drop down. And then you basically repeat that cycle again, where the heart rate gradually climbs up to uh, to to ninety percent. But it, you know, again, I, I don't want to go off on too much of a, a tangent. But one of the things that interval training really challenges is this whole notion of perceived effort versus traditional measures of intensity. And so, if you look at exercise guidelines, you will read things like, "Well, on the zero to ten scale, you know." seven out of 10 might correspond to a heart rate of 140 beats per minute or so, or 70% of maximum. But what we find in our studies is that when people do interval training, they can actually do much more vigorous exercise, but their RPEs, their ratings of perceived effort, uh, remain relatively low. And so the more intense the exercise, the greater the disconnect between how hard you're actually working and how hard you actually perceive it to be. And so it's really requiring a rethink of how we prescribe exercise, certainly when it comes to these RPE or rating of perceived effort ranges, because most of those ranges are based on continuous exercise protocols. And uh, it's, it's a challenge right now, candidly, in the interval training research realm in terms of how we start to translate this message to the general public and you'll you'll know from my book that i tried to use this zero to ten yeah. scale yeah yeah uh, but it's it's not necessarily perfect and what's a six for you is not necessarily a six for someone else especially when they're first starting out exactly. uh, you know so in our studies we'll try to give people a range and say okay zero is you know you're lying in bed all day 
10 is that sprint from danger. And then we try to scale it for them a little bit so they can start to uh, appreciate that. But after a while, people figure it out. And we all have a pretty good sense of our own perception of effort. And uh, it, it becomes relatively consistent across people uh, after they get over that initial learning phase. For sure. I was also thinking about the, the two minutes breaks. Like, why do you have the two minutes breaks there in, in the four by four? Yeah. And so in some of the studies, uh, again, they're a little bit longer, but, but two minute breaks, again, what you're trying to do in the breaks is provide adequate recovery that the person can then come back and do the interval again. Yeah. Because if recovery is too short, they're not able to maintain four minutes or the pace drops off so dramatically that the workout is unlikely to be effective. Um, you know, the longer the recovery period, generally speaking, the better, not always, but generally speaking, because you fully recover and then you're able to come back and and do a, a solid interval again. But, you know, you, recovery period can be too long. Uh, you know, and then at what point is it, well, you're just coming back later and doing another exercise session. Uh, and again, this is a whole nother argument of how long <laughs> yeah. recovery period be. But, uh, you know, there, there's some reasonable ground there between allowing adequate recovery so that you can do the subsequent interval, but it's not so long that you're detracting from the effectiveness of that interval because things are spaced too far apart. Okay, interesting. And also, and, and then also, if we, if we end with the cool down then, like why, why is the cool down important? Yeah. So again, a couple of reasons. Um, there's definitely, you know, we, the old term used to be metabolic waste products and people think of a classic thing like lactic acid. Well, lactic acid, it's not really a waste product. It's still actually a, a valuable metabolic fuel. But what we want to do is we want to get it out of the muscle and transport it to other tissues where it can be used, such as your liver or your heart. And so one of the things that a cool down does, it literally it keeps the blood flowing at a higher rate through the muscles and that helps with the removal of some of these metabolic byproducts and it helps with the restoration uh, of recovery. So there's a metabolic aspect to recovery and there's a cardiovascular aspect to recovery. And you can imagine, you may have experienced this before, maybe you've been late for a flight or you're running for an elevator and you sprint for the elevator and then you suddenly stop and you may feel a little bit lightheaded. Yes. Uh, and people might get dizzy or fall down. And, and that's because you have, you, you know, your muscles have worked so hard and they're, they're very open, if you will, or they're, all the blood vessels are dilated. And so all the blood pools in your lower body and it makes it hard for the blood to be returned back up to the heart and get to the brain. So your blood pressure drops quite significantly because of all this blood pooling. And that's, that's one of the reasons why people feel faint. Uh, and so recovery is important uh, to assist with that as well. So sort of, you know, you're you're landing the airplane slowly, if you will, um, and uh, and you know that 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 helps uh, mitigate any risk of of things like fainting or or that. Right. Very good. Um, I was also one thing that I was also thinking about before we start ending ending the conversation here is safety because I because I know or I think that a lot of people also might be a little bit worried about we're talking we'll be talking about some exercise regimes that are a bit more intense um, are there any risks to interval training and if so who should avoid it yeah so the, there there's as with any form of exercise there's risks and and we can generally put those into two categories there there's the the cardiac risks you know so risk of heart attack and things like that or stroke yeah. uh and there's uh musculoskeletal risks so things like spraining your knee or or things like that so you know generally speaking people are more concerned about the former uh because there can be such stark and dramatic impacts of of that um what i can say is more intense exercise is transiently elevates your risk and there's there's that that's true but i think that risk needs to be put in context and yeah. so there have been studies again in these cardiac rehab settings where they've done relatively large numbers of individuals who are performing moderate intensity exercise or high intensity interval exercise the absolute risk of a heart attack or stroke is slightly higher with the more vigorous exercise, but the overall risk from both of those is relatively low. Uh, and, and certainly then if you do more vigorous exercise, while your risk might be transiently higher 
during the vigorous exercise, in the other 23 and a half hours of the day, your relative risk is actually lower. And, right, you know, I go into some context right, in my book. Yeah. So, I, you know, the bottom line for people is ideally, especially if you're older or you may have some silent risk factors, it's best to get an assessment by a physician at the individual level. Because at the, you know, again, I don't want to keep using COVID-19 analogies, but what we'd really like to identify with COVID-19 are who are these individuals who actually have the disease and are likely to be these super spreaders? Yeah. We would really like to identify those people and keep them out. Yeah. Um, similarly, we'd really like to be able to identify those few individuals who are particularly susceptible to a cardiovascular event if they do vigorous exercise. It's actually quite challenging to do that even with physician uh, workups. But anyway, you know, it's best to get assessed if you can. But I think people need to be, need to be mindful of or remember the greater risk to your health is remaining sedentary. Yeah. And so perhaps there should be signs in doctor's offices that warn people of the tremendous cardiovascular risk by just com <laughs> completely remaining sedentary all of the time. <laughs> True. Um, so I, I, again, I don't mean to make light of it. Uh, so the big takeaway there is it is important to get screened if you can, but the overall risk is relatively low and that's supported by scientific studies. Um, on the on the musculoskeletal risk side, this is where the mode of exercise is very important. So again, as people get older, they might have some thinning of their cartilage, they might have some previous knee injury. If they go all out sprinting, running on a track, they're setting themselves up for trouble. Um, but they could probably perform very vigorous exercise on a cycle ergometer or on a rowing ergometer or in a swimming pool uh, without you know, presenting very much risk at all uh, to their joints. And so I think that's where, again, people need to know themselves. And the nature of the exercise is is quite important in terms of the relative risks of uh, joint injuries and musculoskeletal pulls and things like that. For sure. And and just just to uh, to make it really clear. So when we're talking about before with the heart and like heart attacks and stuff like that, like you said it was a relative low, low risk. Like what does that mean? Like how how low is the risk if you could like from one to a hundred or somebody, some, or some, some other way to, to give a good example of how low sure. the risks are. So I'll, I'll give you a very specific example. And this is where, you know, certainly when I'm talking to the media or giving scientific presentations, I always make the point, you know, I'm a physiologist. I'm not a, not a cardio, uh, I, I, I'm not a physician, uh, and I'm, uh, you know, not a cardiac rehabilitation, uh, specialist. So my background is, is not medical training. It's scientific training yeah. as a physiologist. When I look at the literature though, I, I had alluded to those studies where they'd looked at um, cardiac rehab patients. Uh, there was one particular study where they had uh, roughly 5,000 individuals who were roughly divided in two. So when, the, when roughly 2,500 people uh, were doing moderate intensity uh, training, uh, there was uh, one uh, event and it was a fatal heart attack. Right. Uh, when the group was doing the interval exercise, there were two events out of the 5,000 individuals, both of which were, were non-fatal uh, heart attacks. So those risks are, you know, one in 2,500 or one in 1,250. Right. Now, it was observed in those studies that when people were doing the high-intensity interval, they were engaged in less time. And so on a time commitment level, it was actually about a five-fold higher risk with intervals compared to continuous. But again, in the big picture, relatively low uh, there has been some other studies that suggest maybe the relative risk is a little bit higher, but again, we just don't have these large scale randomized trials where all of these adverse incidents uh, have, have been reported. The other thing that I would observe is, you know, interval training has just exploded over the last 10 years. Yeah. And, you know, I think five or six times in the last 10 years, it's ranked among the top in terms of worldwide fitness trends. And so when you consider the huge number of individuals that have gotten into interval training worldwide, there has not been an explosion of deaths and heart attacks. And again, that's not scientific, that's not medical, that's just an observation. But I think it's, um, you know, again, what I'm trying to say here, people still need to get checked. I don't think we should overstate the risk and there is just hundreds and hundreds of scientific studies that have looked at interval training 
in all sorts of at-risk individuals, including heart disease, cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, obese individuals, older individuals. Uh, and, you know, I would add the type of interval training is really important. You know, type overweight, older, type 2 diabetics doing interval walking is very different from a young person jumping on a bike and pedaling as fast as they can for 20 seconds. So even when we talk about risk of interval training, it really depends the type of interval training that we're talking about and common sense should prevail. You know, if you're a completely sedentary person who never exercises, then starting out with some interval walking or even just steady state walking is a good strategy. You know, jumping off your couch and going to the track and sprinting as hard as you can or uphill, probably not your best call. So there's an element of common sense there, I think. For sure. So for, for anybody who would like to lo- learn more about, let's, let's say that we'll, they would like to learn more about intermittent, no, <laughs> intermittent fast. If, if somebody would like to learn more about these things, do you, do you, can you recommend any books or web pages or anything like that? Yeah, so obviously uh, I'll give myself a plug here. So I, I have written a book uh, intended for uh, general uh, lay audiences. So people who are interested in health and fitness, but don't necessarily have a, a scientific uh, background. And that's uh, the One Minute Workout, which is available widely online. It's published by Penguin uh, Random House. So that's one potential uh, source. Um, you could go to my website, uh, martingabala.com, uh, which lists uh, some of my other podcast presentations. It lists a number of links to our scientific uh, studies. Uh, and my colleagues and I at McMaster University uh, recently developed a, a course which is freely available online. It's called Hacking Exercise for Health. Uh, it consists of about 25 short five-minute video segments uh, that talks about applying interval training strategies, applying resistance training uh, strategies uh, there's an option that, you know, people could register and get a credential for the course uh, that requires a small fee, but they don't have to pay that at all. And all of the modules are freely available. And that's through an, an online learning platform uh, called Coursera. But if people just Googled hacking exercise for health, uh, the link should come up uh, and they, again, would have free access to all of the modules uh, in this short course, which, again, is intended for people who are interested in exercise for health, uh, but don't certainly have any scientific background. Very cool. And I would also really, really like to recommend the book, The One Minute Workout. I mean, the, the work that you've done and all the science that backs it up and everything. And it's also a book that is very pedagogical and written in a way that anybody can understand, which is, I think, very important when it comes to spreading knowledge, such as the science that you've done. So I can really, really recommend the book for anybody who's interested in learning more about interval training or just exercise in, in general. Um, and, and then and there's a last question also, um, or <laughs> two more questions then. Uh, where can people find you uh, and your work? Are you on social media or somebody else, or somewhere else? I- I am. So I, I, I am on Twitter at Gabala M. I'm not particularly active in, in tweeting, but uh, they, they will see uh, some tweets. And uh, for example, just <laughs> yeah. this week, I, uh, I tweeted out a link to a, a very short piece that I wrote for my uh, institutional website about uh, trying to keep fit during a pandemic. Um, and like I say, the, the website would be the other uh, main place. Great. All right. So what, what would you say? Like, what would you say are the, the key takeaways from uh, today's conversation? So interval training uh, is potentially for everyone. There are many different ways that you can do it. Uh, I have heard it said before, so I can't lay claim to this, but I love the quote, and that's, life is an interval exercise, and so you should train appropriately. (laughs) (laughs) That's a great one. I like that one. You know, even if you look at children in the park, very few sort of jog in place for 30 minutes they run and jump and, and go around. And in some ways, life is like that. It gets very hectic. We have to race for something. We have to slow down. And so perhaps modifying our activity to reflect that is going to uh, you know, prepare us uh, best uh, for the challenges that we experience every day. For sure. Martin, I would just like to say a big, big thank you for, I mean, from the work that you've done. I, I really, really think highly of, of people as yourself who are really focused on like a couple of things and that can teach us us normal people in a way 
a lot of a lot of stuff so big big thank you for everything that you've done and for the book and for coming on to the show i i really really appreciated talking to you so big big thank you for coming on oh andre i really appreciate the opportunity to come on uh, i hope the conversation has been of some benefit for your listeners and you know these types of forums i think are really really important because uh, they provide scientists like me with the opportunity to try and engage in science communication and and translate our our, our message. And so uh, it's important that we are able to do this. And uh, I hope uh, the message has some value, as I say, to your listeners, because I, uh, I certainly am mindful of their time as well. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Friends, I really need your help. I'm trying to get the podcast out there so i was wondering if you could help me by leaving a positive rating and a review on your apple device or the podcast player that you're using as well as subscribing to the podcast that really helps getting the show more visible on itunes and other players and if you don't know how it's done then youtube has a lot of great videos so you can search there all right That's it. Take care. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, including the giving of medical advice. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment.